ship's hold filled with mailbags this time of year, for the Christmas mail is on its way. Thousands and thousands of bags of it. And that means a pile of real work to be done by the Canadian Postal Corps. Handling mail for the Canadian Army, Navy and Air Force in England is about equivalent to doing the same job for a city the size of Montreal or Liverpool or Detroit. And when Christmas parcels are added to the regular flow, that makes an awful pile of mail. Don't worry, Joe. There must be something for you. The mailbags are brought from the various ports of arrival to the base post office for sorting. No matter how heavy the mail may be, it's a point of honor with the Postal Corps that everything received in the morning is resorted and sent out again the same night. Only a smooth running system makes this possible. Most of the men have had many years experience in the civilian post offices in Canada and are well used to the annual headaches of Christmas mail. The bags are sealed and ready for delivery to their various destinations, units, headquarters and attachments. It's a happy day when Santa Claus finally catches up with the troops in the field. Because even if there's no snow on the ground, it's still Christmas. In 1885, Billy Buchanan was a drummer boy with the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. In 1942, now a Portsmouth accountant, he visited his old regiment. It was a memorable occasion for Billy Buchanan at being with the unit in its first battle. It happened at Fish Creek during the Riel Rebellion. The newly organized rifles had marched some 300 miles through the bush when they ran into a mixed force of half-breeds and Indians. Bitter fighting started. The enemy were crack shots and they had good cover but the riflemen were too much for them. During the action, the 16-year-old drummer boy brought up ammunition to the forward troop with such coolness and nonchalance that he was mentioned in dispatches. After the battle, the enemy prisoners called the rifles the Little Black Devils from their toughness and their dark green uniforms. And it was the littlest and the blackest devil of them all who drummed them on to victory and set them marching down the years of Canadian history. Beneath a once abandoned mine head in a lonely corner of the mountains of Britain, the jackhammers of Canadian miners are writing their own page in the history of the war. A small detachment of Royal Canadian Engineers doing exploratory diamond drilling have made rich discoveries of an ore vital to war production. bit of the drill must be perfectly true to cut its way through rock. Each little diamond must be carefully set in place by skilled hands. Working hundreds of feet underground, these men are doing a wonderful job in bolstering production. There are other RCE detachments doing similar work in old mines all over Great Britain. The sappers do the exploratory work and get the mine into production then turn it over to civilian miners to carry on. Far from any town or village, laundry becomes a problem that needs personal attention. As a matter of fact, the whole establishment is run along happy family lines, and the meals are well worth writing home about. What's that on the table? Sinkers. The inevitable crib board is traditional with Canadians, but nearly equally traditional is the equally inevitable dark board. But meanwhile, work goes on. Another shift takes over, and a weary crew returns to the surface. For there's no rest in work like this. Three eight-hour shifts keep development going ahead every minute of the day. It's a tough job, but a vital one, and a big one for ten men and a sergeant.
Eyes front! And the graduating Octu cadets are ready for their final inspection. Rifles moved up to the slope with a timed precision worthy of the brigade of guards and snapped to a faultless present as the inspecting officer, Brigadier Marcel Noel, came on parade. Accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Hodson, commanding the Octu wing at CTS, Brigadier Noel inspected the future officers, appraising their quality with a keen eye. Here are men from every branch of the Canadian Army and from all corners of the Dominion. Men chosen for their ability and leadership. Here are future leaders of our Army. In one of the lecture halls where they had studied so hard for weeks, the cadets received their certificates from Brigadier Noel. Theirs is indeed an enviable trust, but one of great responsibility, the King's Commission. The Quacks are here, the first detachment of the Canadian Women's Army Corps. For the first time in history, Canadian women have been called upon to serve beside their menfolk as soldiers in the Canadian Army. Their job is to release fit men for more active service. Major Sorby, senior quack officer in England, greets Captain Riley commanding the detachment. It doesn't take long for the girls to get to work. Most of this draft have been trained as military clerks to relieve pressure on headquarters staffs. And here's a quack grass woman. Incidentally, this gal draws trades pay. The girls live in barracks, and in spite of the feminine influence, it's still an army setup. Home was never like this. But you're in the army now, gal, so don't forget the old spit and polish. Good night. On December 17, 1939, the first Canadians landed in Britain, vanguard of a great army. They came to finish the job that their fathers had begun a quarter of a century before. In June 1940 came the first call to action. In high spirits, they marched to the ships on their way to France, itching for a fight. Once across the channel, the Canadians penetrated more than 200 miles. But with the tragic collapse of France came the order to return to Britain. In the dark days after Dunkirk, almost the only trained and equipped troops between Hitler and London were General McNaughton's Canadians, who stood guard throughout those days of high tension. While hurricanes swept the sky, Canadian ak ak batteries blazed at the Luftwaffe from the ground, playing their part in the Battle of Britain. The first great combined operation was in September 1941, when Pott's polar pirates beat the Germans to the draw at Spitsbergen. This was scorched earth on a grand scale. Radio stations, transformers, warehouses, coal mines, blasted to hell to clear the sea route to the fighting Russians. The Dieppe raid was part of the battle plan now unfolding in the Mediterranean area. This diversionary attack kept large numbers of German troops nailed to the channel. It helped Montgomery and Eisenhower to hit the Germans a crushing blow on the flank and break the Axis power in North Africa. In the solemn quietness of Brookwood Cemetery, Canadians who fought for freedom at Dieppe were laid to rest. These men will be avenged.
And now the Canadians are preparing to rip through the Huns when the Allied War Council gives the signal for the cross-channel dash on the road to Berlin. The Canadians are ready. Zero hour is coming. <laughs> 